All right, I think we can go ahead and start our conversation. Uh, welcome this morning. My name is Carrie Zimmerman. I'm excited to have this conversation with you today about unconscious bias and how it impacts our decision making, our lives, our interactions with other people. Uh, I want to give you a couple of reminders as we get started. One is that this session is being recorded. So if that helps you think about um, whether your camera is on or not, if you're in a space where that's comfortable, just want to make sure that you know that it is being recorded um, and an edited version of it without um, all of our chit chat at the beginning will be posted on the college website. Um, in fact, all of this week's presentations um, are going to be up on the website for anyone to review or go back to or watch if they missed one. Uh, the other thing I um, want to say is make sure your name is up so we can talk. Um, this will be interactive, especially with this great size of a group. Um, I'm hoping for some good conversation and input. And feel free to engage in any way that's comfortable for you, whether it's the chat or you've got the ability to mute and unmute yourself. Um, feel free to uh, just talk to us, ask questions, or you can raise your hand. I'll try to... Um, pay attention to both the chat and the hand raising and um, people speaking. Um, so I'm glad that you're here this morning as we talk about this. As we've done all week in our conversations around inclusion, justice, equity, uh, we've made a point to um, remind ourselves and one another that we're entering this journey from different places that we each have different levels of comfortability, um, uh, different experiences, our individual backgrounds and stories um, are what add to the richness of this conversation. Um, whether a first year student, a, um, a post back student, a staff member, a faculty member, the dean, um, whether you have been deeply invested in this work, um, for years or you're just dipping your toe into the pool um, of thinking about some of this. We're glad that you're here and you're welcome here and your questions are welcomed. Um, we're about learning and exploring and doing so in a setting that is um, respectful and open and sincere um, uh, and sometimes vulnerable. Uh, sometimes the topics that we talk about are deeply personal. And um, it's, it's one of the reasons that these conversations are powerful. So today, as we start with the topic of unconscious bias, we're going to do a, um, a, uh, a dive into the science, the facts around it, um, where it came from, and then we're going to have some conversations as a group. So I'm going to go ahead and turn our screen on um, for some information and make sure you all can see all of that. So we're talking about the filters that shift all of our perspectives and that impact our educational and professional culture. So unconscious bias, um, we're just gonna start with some definitions that we began with early in the week in our foundations conversation about language. It's important that we know what we mean by the words that we're saying. And so bias um, was one of the words that we defined. When someone says, oh, um, he's biased, or they're biased, or that opinion is biased, it is simply a tendency to prefer one thing or person over another. We all have biases. They are a part of who we are. Um, it's a prejudice, either positive or negative, um, against uh, a thing, a person, a group, in comparison to another, often usually when we talk about a bias, there's a negative connotation with that. So I'll be like, oh, they're biased. And we mean that negatively, like it's judgmental or, um, you know, isn't giving someone a fair shake. But bias for all of us um, is, is internal. We all have these. They can be based on anything from visible identities or attributes uh, like race or gender. They can also be invisible, um, invisible biases um, that come up. There are two types of biases, a conscious bias and an unconscious bias. Sometimes they're also referred to as explicit or implicit biases. And so the conscious ones are the ones that we know about. Those are the biases that we're aware of. Um, you may have a preference for a particular 
type of food or you may be attracted to a specific race of person. Um, you may feel strongly about um, a, a football, a specific football team or um, a way that something is done and you know it. You, um, you either embrace it or you fight against it, but you're aware of it. Because again, biases are both, they can be both positive and negative. Now, the unconscious biases are the ones that we have that we might not know come into our brains. One of the difficulties of thinking through bias is that because it's a natural part of who we are, scientists have done deep dives, deep studies, neurologists, sociologists, um, psychiatrists, psychologists, into what our biases are. And they started with the science, the neurons of messaging that come at us. And they have estimated that in a single interaction between another person, there are 11 million messages coming at you in that single um, encounter with another person. You are getting them from every sense that you have from sight and, and hearing and, and smell and touch and, and taste and memory and external messages that are coming at you, 11 million. And your brain is filtering them without you being conscious of it. It goes back into the very core of our fight or flight brain response. It's what's allowed us to survive. If, if the cave people had to go through 11 million pieces of information as a saber-toothed tiger is running at them, we wouldn't exist today because they would all be dead. There would be no amount of time to be able to get through, is this dangerous? Are they going to hurt me? How fast are they running? Can I outrun them? If you have to make those in order one at a time, you're dead. And so our brain has evolved and developed into ways that lets us filter through these conversations filter through all of the information so we survive. And so we're not even aware of that, that 11 million shifts quickly into about 40 or 50 pieces of information that we're able to process knowingly. Then that 40 or 50 gets down to about 10 or 11, where we are able to make decisions, able to go forward, so it goes from 11 million to about 11 in a split second. So we have all of this going on, conscious, unconscious, uh, and the filters are not limited to the things that we generally talk about with a bias. You know, it's not limited to ethnicity or race or gender. Uh, those are well-documented, lots of studies about biases that people have, but they can extend toward any social group, any age, um, it could be physical abilities or religion or sexual orientation or weight or accent or the way that someone dresses, what major they chose, what kind of car they drive or music they listen to or how they wear their hair. There are messages for us around all of this and we tend to think and feel more positively or less positively um, about people based on some of those, um, on some of those categories. So it's true whether those are conscious or unconscious. Now, one of our struggles is that because the word bias has had a negative connotation, um, we don't like to think of ourselves as biased. We tend to tie that to being a good or a bad person. Um, but bias is not about morality. It's not about goodness. Um, we all have biases. And when we begin to recognize that, when we get to a point of being able to say, of course I have biases, you know, of, of course I have preferences, of course messages have impacted me, um, then we're able to begin to understand them. So even though some of these um, things we know, some we don't, it's not connected to being a good person or a bad person. Um, our brains are processing all of this information at one time, and those shortcuts are really help us what narrow down what this is, but it also leads to blind spots. And that's what we're going to talk about today is what our blind spots are. What are the areas that we don't even necessarily know? It means being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And so it can be uncomfortable for any of us to talk about where we have a bias and where those come from and the ones we're aware of and the ones that we're not aware of. So let's talk a little bit more about unconscious bias. 
So these are the social stereotypes that are outside of our individual awareness, the ones that we know. We've all got them. Um, they can be tied to any category, any way, but we've all got them. I talked about the science of the 11 million pieces of information that come flying at us all the time. Here's some more information that we know. Our unconscious biases develop early on from middle childhood, they think, um, in terms of our interactions as we begin to uh, interact with people outside of our uh, nuclear environment, the more outside messages that we get, whether that's, uh, you know, from a television show or um, whether it's interacting with, you know, kids at school, different types of uh, neighborhood interactions, they begin to develop, we begin to make sense, our brain does, of all of the messages that we're getting from the media, from our family, from outside people. And these messages have real effects on our behavior, on who we move toward and who we run away from, who we deem to be safe, who we think is unsafe, who we seek to build a relationship with, who we don't want to have anything to do with. Um, a lot of those have to do with these, the unconscious way that our brain, it's like a big file folder in there, putting things in order. The good news is, you know, we said, we don't know these are happening. They are unconscious. They develop in everyone. That can make us throw our hands up and say, well, I can't do anything about this. You know, I, I have got these biases. So am, am I just stuck? Do I just have to deal with this? The hopeful piece of this is that our, even our unconscious biases are malleable. Once we begin to pause, to recognize where we might be following our um, back of our brain primal urges one way or another, we can begin to do some assessment of why am I feeling this way? Why am I leaning toward or away from a group of people or an individual person? Um, and so we can't totally erase them. We can't just say no, all of that neurological messaging that's um, been, you know, filtered in a cellular level in my brain. I'm just going to shift all that. Um, but we can with, with behavior, with thought, with um, some intentional time spent sitting with that, um, we can do some shifting. We can become more aware um, and have more control over um, how those filter out to other people. So speaking of filters, um, we all have these. They come from everywhere, every part um, of our lives, and they change how we view the world. Now, when I was a kid, we didn't have Instagram. I didn't have an iPhone in my pocket. Um, I was big time when I got like a little, you know, Kodak camera, but mostly we had those, you know, black and gold Kodak disposable, uh, you know, little 35 millimeter, you take pictures and we had to drop them off at the drugstore and wait, uh, I don't know, a day, a week. I don't remember how long it took, but it was not immediate to get our pictures back. So we never knew whether it was a good picture or bad picture. It was often, you know, of someone's thumb or blurry or light exposure or the ground or the sky, or you'd cut people out. There was no filtering of these pictures. You got exactly what that cheap little plastic click took in your screen. Today, that is not the case. We have immediate access. Uh, we not only can take a picture, we can decide if it's framed the way we want it to be. Um, and once we get the picture right framed, then the filtering starts. Let me change the color. Let me change how I look. Let me whiten my teeth and make the sky look brighter. I'm going to focus these colors. I'm going to, and the end product is different than the original picture that we took. Um, so we're used to filtering. We're, we're pretty good at it um, in terms of making the image into the image that we want. And so that's what we do with our internal brain filters. We do it on Instagram with some clicks. Our brain is doing it automatically. Through the filters that we view the world, we look at people differently. If I have a positive feeling about someone or a group of people, my image of them in my mind gets brighter or more intense, or the fuzzy, warm, lovey kind of pictures, you know, that we can do on Instagram and drop some hearts. Our brains do that. 
Conversely, if I've got negative feelings or experiences about a person, a group of people, that picture in my mind, that perception of them, my brain starts dropping filters in front of that, you know, cloudy or out of focus, uh, angry colors, whatever it is that we're feeling, our brains are doing that for us. So what we see is not necessarily what we would call objective truth. What we see has been filtered by our brain, just like the pictures that we take get filtered by what we want it to look like. We've all got them and we're really gonna talk about them in a few minutes, but I want to go over um, five types of filters, five types of biases through which we begin to drop into our brain. We're, here's the list of them, but we're gonna talk about each one of them too. The first one is the one that you probably know the most. It's the one that we talk about when we think about biases. It's identity bias. This is, you know, uh, gender bias. It is um, age, name, beauty. Um, it's the things that um, shift and change in terms of, you know, how we think about other people. I had said I learned this week from my conversations with you all as designers and architects and planners and uh, incredibly smart people that there is a basic height for human models in, and it's, you know, it's six feet. And so an interesting fact has come up um, in the studying I was doing about this is that um, let's talk about this six foot height. So in the United States, 14% of men are six feet tall or higher, 14%. Yet, 60%, 6-0, of men who are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are over six feet tall. So somewhere, it's not that being taller makes you a better leader. It doesn't make you a better manager. It does not make you uh, more able to lead a Fortune 500 company. But somewhere in our cultural, societal development, we have equated height and also maleness um, and whiteness. I mean, we can add lots of things to this with leadership, with strength, with vision. And so it's not that being tall uh, is a qualification for being um, a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, but that has come up. Name bias is a consistent issue that happens. Um, Pew Research um, through MIT and the University of Chicago has done studies about name bias and what it does in the hiring practices specifically based on race. And they have looked at what we would call uh, traditionally white names and traditionally black names. So what they did was send out 1,200 uh, applications, identical applications except for the names on them. And they sent one set out that had traditionally white names like, you know, Emily, Gregory might be the, you know, traditional white names. Uh, Jamal, Nakisha were some of the names they used for more traditional black names. Identical resumes, applications, except for that. They sent them out. Even with companies who uh, claimed and advertised inclusion and diversity and a desire to have um, a, a broad, equitable workforce and leadership crew, there were 50% more callbacks for people who had the traditional white sounding names. So there, is, there are real implications to these identity biases that we have. They impact hiring and advancement and admittance to colleges and grad schools and selections for awards and scholarships and it comes up in so many places and so we're going to come back to identity in just a minute but first i'm going to go over affinity bias confirmation bias attribution bias then we're going to talk about the halo effect and the horn effect which are two of my favorites um oh let me say something else about name bias um We've said that these are innate, internal to people. They, the, those filters start at an early age. Um, outside of the United States, similar studies have been done um, in the Netherlands with Muslim sounding names, um, uh, in Singapore with Chinese names, exact same results. This is a global human 
phenomena. It's not, this is not just about the United States. Um, all right, let's talk about affinity bias. This is where, it's also called similarity bias, um, but this is where we tend to connect with, um, we tend to have uh, conversations about, um, love to just interact with people that we have similar interests, experiences, and backgrounds with. If you are like someone, if you find a connection, there's this immediate likability. Um, the example that I use is, you know, a, a, day or go, a day ago, I was having a conversation with Tom, who works in the college, um, and he just mentioned that he grew up in North Carolina. He was telling the story, and I said, I grew up in North Carolina. So we kind of had both this immediate, like, oh, hey, no, no, and we talked a little about North Carolina. Now, I don't know what you know about North Carolina, but we have a deep-seated state rivalry against the far inferior state of South Carolina. And um, there is this ongoing uh, battle. And, you know, you might as well talk, you be talking about good and evil. And lots of states have this, you know, kind of pairing with this. I'm sure there's a Kansas, Missouri, very similar uh, kind of battle back and forth. Um, and so immediately that connection that, really doesn't connect us much at all on any significant level made me like him like I just had that that's an affinity bias you know if choosing between uh, a North Carolina new acquaintance and a South Carolina new acquaintance I might lean toward the North Carolina one just because of the ridiculous kinds of ways in which we add value to things so affinity bias is just that oh uh, you know, uh, gosh, I like to hike too, or, oh, I love Mexican food, or when you see that, you're drawn closer, and you're positive bias toward that person. It has nothing to do with their skill set. It has nothing to do with ability or performance. It's simply a bias based on the thing, uh, the fact that you share some similar experiences or backgrounds or interests. Um, you can probably think of moments when you have had affinity bias, both positive and negative, towards someone. Um, the person may be fantastic, um, but if there's something about um, their background that you have a negative sense about, you might be like, well, oh, I don't know, let's pick this other person. So affinity bias works both ways. All right, the next one is confirmation bias. So this is where we draw conclusions about someone based on our beliefs, our own prejudices, rather than on their merit, their performance. Um, and so we might decide that, you know, it's more important for someone to be left-handed in this, in this job. We think left-handed people are more creative, for example. It's a creative position. I definitely want to hire a left-handed person because they're more creative. Well, that's nonsense. But if we have this belief, um, then we're going to lean toward that. That has nothing to do with the other person. Confirmation bias also comes into play in the fact that we are drawn to people who agree with us. If, they're, if you're uh, on social media and you're reading an article and um, it lines up with your values, you give it more weight. You think it, the, the author is, they have more expert opinion um, because they are agreeing with you. It confirms what you believe to be true. And again, this can be positive or negative in terms of your feelings. You might lean towards someone because they share a desire, a belief, um, or you may push away from someone or a group because they have the opposite. All right, third one is attribution bias. Uh, this, this has to do with um, everything from um, prior interactions with someone, um, their past. If you have had even one negative interaction with a person, you can attribute the rest of their behavior or performance on that previous uh, encounter. It can be difficult to get away from this. We form opinions pretty quickly. And it can be hard um, to say, well, you know, that, that first project you did, that first test, the first time I worked with you in a group, I did not have a good experience. And so the second time you have an encounter, even if their performance is vastly different, different even if they are uh, excelling, there's still a perception you have, 
you have a filter that they may not be as successful or they may not work as hard. Um, if someone is late to the first meeting that you have with them, you may then begin to think of that person as perpetually late, even though they're only late one time. It often holds people to past behavior without allowing them any type of current or future option to shift what that is. Again, some of these are, can be positive or negative. If someone excels the first time, you might think, oh, they are always so good at this. If you write a perfect first paper, sometimes it's hard as a grader to not think, wow, they had that great first paper. And you may give more weight to the second project or paper that they turn in. Which brings us to the halo effect and a dog or two. Uh, I said yesterday when I was talking about this, that if you are, you know, looking, um, you know, for graphics and stock images, um, it can be hard to find um, a, a diverse set of photographs. So I, we went with dogs because, you know, everybody needs to see a good puppy. So the halo effect is this. This is where you simply think more highly of someone else because um, you care about them because there's something impressive about them. You put a little halo up on their head. Um, and so if, let's talk politics, for example. If there is uh, a politician that you like, that you agree with, that you think is a good person, if they say something um, ignorant or hurtful or have a misstep, we tend to dismiss it more because we're like, no, they're good. They didn't mean that. That was just a misstep. You know, that's not a big deal. Um, and so we tend to give people more credit because we've put a halo on their head. We have begun to think of them in a way that, oh, well, they, they, they wouldn't do that. Um, this has come up in, um, we're talking about criminal cases. There have been um, well-reported documents of in collegiate sexual assault cases where people have failed to see that the perpetrator of a sexual assault did that because they knew them as a good person. And so the facts have been pushed aside and people have said, oh, he would never do that or she would never do that. They're such a kind person or a good person. And so we, we tend to give people more credit um, when we have positive feelings about them. The converse of that is what we call the horns effect. Again, with a cute dog. Um, this is the fact that we tend to have a negative perception of people, more negative when we've learned something unpleasant about them or negative about them. Back to politics. If there is a leader or a politician that you disagree with, it doesn't matter what they say or do, you're going to think the worst of it and them. And so we don't take in information in a vacuum, in a silo. We're viewing things through filters. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away on Friday and people have strong feelings about her, both positive and negative. And so if you were on the positive side of that, everything she does, you may think is wonderful and glowing and perfect. If you think she's on the wrong side of issues and has done damage to the country, then you think everything that she does, her entire persona is negative. And so it becomes hard for us to have objectivity, to think of things outside the framework that we have built around the filters through which we see people. I'm sure we have all experienced this at some point when we realize oh, okay, I, I realize that I'm either not giving enough credit or giving too much credit to an incident, a person, because I just, I, I dislike them or what they stand for. Um, or I really love them, care about them, and so I'm going to give more credit than I would outside of this. It happens with individual relationships. It happens with public figures. It happens with um, issues and big picture um, things that happen. And so all of these filters, whether we're talking about identity, any kind of identity, um, age, background, size, affinity, confirmation, attribution, they all color, change shape, shift how we see the people and the experiences around us. It happens to all of us. 
being able to recognize some of them, acknowledging that, oh, this is something I just need to be cognizant of. Um, having some sense of awareness that this is going on can be incredibly helpful um, in terms of considering, am I doing all that I can to make sure that the groups I'm in are equitable, that we have inclusion, that I'm not making decisions based more on filter, more on bias, and less on merit, less on skill, less on um, ability to do the job or lead the conversation. So we've talked about halo and horns, and I would like to be clear that I do not have any ill feelings against bulldog puppies. Um, just because this dog is the one with the horns on, all dogs are good. Everyone thinks their dog is the best dog and everyone is right. So let's talk about some data and statistics. These came from the Department of Labor and I shared these the first afternoon that we were together um, introducing this week of talking about justice. And uh, I think it's important to revisit these as we think about the real life impact that some of our filters can have. 72% of women report some type of gender discrimination and harassment at work. 81% of people of color have been the only person of their race in a college or graduate classroom, 81%. 69% of postgraduate students of color have never had a faculty member of their race teach them in their area. 72% of LGBTQ plus folk believe um, that it's not safe or they feel uncomfortable sharing personal details about relationships or family structure at work. And 82% of people with a physical disability say they've been passed over for jobs, promotion, or projects. When we think about these five statistics, we can see that there are real ways in which our um, lack of experience thinking through our filters adds to um, the experiences that people in marginalized identity groups have and go through. Our awareness of these can help us both with our personal interactions, the way that we manage our sphere of influence, but it also can help us as leaders, as professionals, um, as people with influence in our fields, uh, look at the bigger structural issues um, of how we invite people into community, who has power, who doesn't. Um, are we taking time um, in all of the groups in which we participate um, to navigate and think through what filters have come into play, even in building this group and community together? So I said we would come back to identities. We would come back to um, the ways in which that frames what happens. So all of the all of the ways in which we view the world and the world views us have to do with our identities. They frame our story. And each person's story is unique and complex and valuable. Um, it is the way through which we see the world. It's the way that we um, engage. It's the way that we make decisions. It's the way that we decide, um, you know, what's, what's safe and what isn't. And so we're going to spend some time, I think, let me take us off share screen for just a minute. Um, we have got a small enough group. We're on, we're on, we're on a single screen. Um, and so we're not going to divide into groups for this next part. Uh, but what I want us to do is have a conversation about our own identities. We're going to take a minute to think about um, what messages we've gotten, how what we do um, filters what we say and do and think. So I'm going to ask you to grab either um, a piece of paper, pen, pencil, or have the ability to, you know, type into whatever piece of technology you're on right now, um, just to be able to make a list. And again, no, you're not going to have to show your list to anybody or share it unless you want to. Um, this is for you to think about. And um, I imagine we will have some sharing, um, but here's what I want you to do. Um, I'm going to pull up a list of identities, identity categories, and I want you to begin to think about what identities do you claim for yourself? What identities do you think, oh, I'm a part of this group? So if you weren't at the foundational session where we talked about um, identities and identity groups, um, just as a quick review, an identity group is 
any shared characteristic that you have with another uh, person or group of people. Um, for example, um, I identify as a woman. I'm in that identity group. That's an identity for me. Um, I'm Southern. I grew up in North Carolina. Southerner is an identity that I claim for myself. Um, I'm a political junkie. That's an identity I claim for myself. Um, so this can be everything from uh, the categories we generally think about in terms of race, faith, um, sexual orientation, um, age, um, to anything from a bit special abilities that you have. Um, so I'm going to pull up this list. It is in no way um, complete. Um, it's just a starting place for you. And I'm going to give you two or three minutes to, to make your list. Um, so here come um, the categories for you to even think through. Um, so just take a couple of minutes. We'll take two or three minutes of me not talking. Um, and begin to make your list of all of the identities that you claim for yourself. All right, feel free to keep continuing uh, to write your list. So let's talk about what writing a list like this feels like. Um, what it is to try to put down on paper um, identities, categories. Um, it can be difficult to try to do that. Um, is there anybody who wants to share your list or part of your list or um, pieces of it that you feel comfortable sharing? Um, I'll read mine first and you can consider whether you want to read yours. Um, I wrote that I'm a woman, I'm white, I'm an orphan, um, I'm cisgendered and heterosexual, um, I'm right-handed, I'm a feminist, an abolitionist, a person of faith, I'm, um, I'm Southern, I'm a writer, I'm a traveler, I'm from a small town, I'm educated, I'm a seven on the Enneagram, I'm an ENFJ on the, I mean ENFP on the uh, Myers-Briggs, and on Strengths Quest, my top five strengths are uh, strategic input, ideation, communication, and connectedness. So those are, that's my uh, very quick jot it down list. Um, anybody else want to share part or all of your list? I will. So I am Latinx, grew up in San Diego, have five brothers and a sister. I'm the first female of my generation. We probably had about 50 cousins because my dad came from a family of 14. So I'm the first female of my generation to go to college. I'm an introvert, a chef, a fly fisher. I'm a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, the first woman and the first Latino in the state of Kansas and still. Um, I'm an architect. I am also an orphan. 
um, INFJ, and I love traveling. Thanks, Wendy. Anybody else feeling brave? I'll add something. Thanks, Leslie. Um, I, and I also, I will just comment that I observed as I um, wrote these that some of them, you know, have different meanings, like positive and negative, kind of depending on how you frame it. So I'll just say um, white, straight, cisgendered, I'm a citizen. Um, I'm educated. I'm a parent and a mother. Those are two different things. Um, I am Texan and Houstonian and a Southerner. I'm an athlete and an extrovert. I'm a firstborn. I'm Gen X and millennial. I'm on the edge. I'm a nine on the Enneagram. I'm a redhead, which is kind of an invisible group. Um, I'm not Christian or Buddhist, depending on how you want to say that. I'm short and I'm also gifted, which is also often not recognized as um, a group. Thanks. I love hearing that there's something about um, people having the space to talk about this. And you're right, Leslie, it's complicated. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute um, after we see if anybody else wants to share. Um, even, even the labels themselves mean different things to different people at different times. Um, the context is important. Um, I always find myself um, when people are reading these lists, um, thinking about something I've not considered before. Um, I've never had anyone say, um, talk about being a, a parent and a mother as being different things, and they so are. Um, so I, that's, that's, a, that's a new categorization for me um, that I haven't heard someone define quite like that. So thanks for sharing that. Anybody else? I'll read my list. Oh, thanks. I'm a woman, firstborn, Midwestern, feminist, reader, traveler, mother, introvert, painter, and learner. Good. Yeah. I'll, I'll read my list. I'm sorry, my video is not on because I have a Wi-Fi issue today. But we see your beautiful picture, so go ahead. <laughs> Um, I'm a middle-aged Asian, Indian American, privileged, liberal, feminist, female artist, poet, musician, and architect who loves to cook, read, and travel. Thanks. Anyone else? Going once, going twice, gone. Okay. Uh, thanks for sharing those. Uh, I, I always learn things about people and it's a reminder of the complexity of our identities. Uh, we talked earlier this week about intersectionality and how everyone's identities intersect in some way or another. And intersectionality can be both um, the, the layering of privileges or the layering of oppressions. And so all of our identities come with some kind of value, positive or negative, and those can shift and change based on what culture we're in. You may find yourself in the majority um, in a particular part of the country in the U.S. and uh, in a minority in a different part of the country with the same identity. Your identity may mean something positive or negative within your family, and mean and be positive or negative outside your family. So they're fluid. It is this uh, ever-changing tide uh, of understanding of ourselves and thinking about how we view the world. Uh, something else to think about as you look at your list, think about whether the identities that you wrote down are ones that you have claimed for yourself or their identities that the outside world or other people have labeled you with. Because there are both internal and external forces at play in terms of how we view both ourselves and others. Some of them, you know, like, oh, I, I, I claim this, you know, no one else said to me, 
oh, you know, Carrie, you're a writer. Like I myself said, I'm a writer. I'm going to do that. And uh, that is dependent on, you know, the area that you're in. Sometimes our identities can be stripped from us by other people or their value can be taken away. Um, they may try to push, uh, they can't actually strip, they try to strip them away from you um, or try to define them in a way that you wouldn't define it. So as you wrote your list, um, what was difficult about putting this um, on paper? Um, what are some of the challenges of even making a list like this? What's hard about it? One thing for me that was interesting is um, some of them unfolded very easy and obviously, and then other things I, like for example, I have nothing against cats. Like cats are fine, but maybe it's because of your slides. One of the things I put on there was dog person because I, I am more of a dog person than a cat person, but that doesn't mean I don't like cats. Like, so, right. so it was almost like by putting dog person, I was excluding myself from another identity group, which I have nothing against cats. I don't like cats, but I am yeah. a dog person. Yeah, lists by their very nature are exclusionary, right? They, they, it's, it's like it almost asks you to take a stand or not. And if you choose mm -hmm. one, there might be an assumption that you are against the other. And that's not necessarily true at all. Yeah, for sure. Um, something else anyone noticed that might be, that's, that's difficult to make this kind of list. I think one thing for me that was difficult is the intersectionality because I don't think of these things as separate things. They work mm -hmm. together in different situations differently. So to like piece out that I'm a woman from the Midwest, for example, means something different like at school versus in the community versus when I'm with my family. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and even if there are two people who wrote you know, six of the same identities down, that they, they don't have the same experiences. All of the other pieces are of who we are um, weave together to make the, you know, the beautiful tapestry of our lives and our, our presence on the earth. Um, but there, there is no way uh, to just parse out and say, I am this list of words. Who we are is so much greater than the individual components. And so it can be hard to write them down. One of, the, one of the ways that filters come into play and our biases come into play is if we have an understanding of one of these identities, we, as, we often assume that everyone else with that identity has that same experience or that same background. So we begin to, even within an identity group, put everyone together and say, oh, all white men have this same experience. Um, all Jewish women have this, and it's not true. Um, there are, it's much more individual than that, but that becomes a filter for us. It's where the stereotypes come into play. And, and we then begin to attribute behaviors to an identity and not to the individual. And so we begin to say things like, oh, um, you know, if, if you're, if you're a first and an only in a, in a career, in a, in a job, in a position, um, then people tend to look at both failures and successes as attributed to, um, you know, Wendy mentioned being the first, um, woman and Latinx, was it, um, AIA fellow in Kansas? Is that, okay. And so, you know, if, if there is some great success, you know, is that attributed to Wendy being woman? No, it's, it's attributed to Wendy being Wendy. Um, but if there's a failure as a first, then often people say, oh, I knew women couldn't do that job, or a man wasn't going to be good at that, or a gay person isn't capable of. And instead of being that person, we attribute it to whatever identity um, is that we're talking about that might be in the minority of that. Um, other ways that it's hard to make this list. Anything else you can think of? I, th I thought it was hard to make the list because I, you know, started out with things that are obvious that I know about myself. And then towards the end, I put things that other people have labeled me, Ooh. which is not athletic. 
um, multiple divorce, like it's a stigma, mm -hmm. um, and, and some other things. But you know, but like I said, in the beginning, I put things I knew about myself, and then I found myself putting things that other people have decided about me. Oh, Jody, that's really perceptive. Uh, you know, to think about how that happens as we as we begin uh, to think through this, and and considering considering ourselves, taking time to think about who we are, what, what makes up our values and thought processes and, and how we view the world. It, it can be, uh, it can be uncomfortable and it, it can often bring up past experiences or comments that people have made. And it does force us to pause in the middle of all of the external noise that we're getting all of the time. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I thought I'm, uh, I'm going to have all this time. I'm going to, I'm going to read in there. No, if anything, like, I feel like the pandemic, everybody's working harder that, you know, we're having to do things three different ways. And, you know, go, going to the grocery store is like, you know, gearing up to go to the front line. And, um, you know, it's, you know, for a while we were like bleaching the groceries that came in and, you know, you, as you leave the house, you think, do I have my hand sanitizer? Do I have my mask? Do I, you know, is there a place I can go to the bathroom before I get, I mean, there's all this kind of extra stuff that's happening. And so there, there's even more noise right now, I think, and not just because of the pandemic, but because the pandemic is layered into and coupled with our second pandemic that we're dealing with, which is so much deeply seated racial unrest in our country in this moment. I don't know that we can have this conversation today without thinking about um, Breonna Taylor and what's happening in Louisville and other cities and the amount of anger, the amount of exhaustion, um, fear, frustration, every, every emotion um, is happening right now over multiple issues. And in our conversation earlier in the week about can politics be civil in 2020, um, I said I had a very short answer that was no. Nope, thanks for coming on a TED Talk. That's, that's the whole workshop. Can it be civil in 2020? Nope. Um, but we did talk about the fact that we have some ability, some power in how we interact. Um, we have the ability to think about conflict differently, to think about values differently. And it brings us to the realization that all politics are personal. We're not even talking about governance when politics becomes uncivil. It's because we're talking about people's values. We're talking about life and death and what matters to people. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, everything from faith and education and citizenship and um, access to health care and economics. And, and so sometimes we just toss politics as a big category, but it's every category by which we live and frame our lives. So this is true too of this va of this filter uh, labeling conversation as we think about all right what what part of my life and history and interactions with other people are coming into play um, all the things that you all said about what makes making the list difficult are true um, sometimes it's hard because we're not yet ready to to grapple with to acknowledge one or multiple of our own identities. Somehow putting it down on paper or typing it in feels like an acknowledgement of that. Whether it's a, a filter, a label that we put on ourselves or someone else put on us, it takes a moment of pause to actually write it down. And if there are parts of our experience that we're struggling with, we're uncomfortable with, that bring up past experiences, that's difficult to do. That can be incredibly hard to face and deal with. Um, the second thing I think that's difficult about this is that uh, sometimes we've been taught to not brag about ourselves. Sometimes we've been taught that humility is really important and um, you know, don't, don't try to shine too brightly. And I would push against that and say, um, we should never dim the extraordinary parts of who we are. 
that by being our best selves, by lighting up whatever room we come into, by leaning into, embracing, digging deeply into our gifts, our strengths, our talents, makes everyone and everything better, stronger. It rises people up with us like a tide instead of dimming our light so other people might feel more or uh, more comfortable with that. So even, even writing down some things, um, you know, I appreciate that Leslie said gifted, you know, just to be, you know, to even be able to say that, to say, you know, I'm funny, I'm intelligent, I'm whatever those pieces are. Um, other people might say them about this, but it can be difficult to say them about ourselves to embrace the goodness and the brilliance and the beauty um, of what makes us who we are. And so that in and of itself can impact the filters through which we see other people. Um, any other comments about this, this thought of filters or anything else it brought up for you um, in thinking about what it is to examine the ways in which you view the world and, 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 and live within community of other people? Uh, Carrie, I was struck by the temporal nature of some of the ways that we describe ourselves. And, you know, like, and you mentioned anger, like right now, I'd say I'm a pretty angry person. <laughs> I'm pretty frustrated, pretty angry. Um, I, I work at, at not being that way. But when you like, would I put that on the list? Probably not, because I don't want that to be the way I'm characterized and I don't want that to be the way I think of myself mm. and how like when, if I can't even think of a good example right now but what if you're working on changing something when does it make it to the list when, when do you, you or make it off of the list mm. oh what a good thought um I don't know that I've heard anyone say it as eloquently as the temporal nature of the list, um, but it, it, it's true. It is, it is ever changing. It's fluid. Um, when do we decide that's a permanent part of who we are? Um, I, my example of that is orphan. I had such beautiful, remarkable parents and I would have, listed myself as a, as a daughter and, you know, that would have been, but then once my parents passed away, I felt this rush, this immediate rush of, I, I'm an orphan. And I was like 38 years old. Um, you know, my father had died a decade before, but when my mom died, that word flew into my head and my being. And I thought, oh, I am parentless. And I would have never thought of that. I had, I had such caring, loving parenting my, my whole life that I never would have thought that would be an identity where I thought, oh, I, that, that rudder, I felt rudderless in the parental framework of that. And it would not have been um, on my list at all until that. So it's, it's interesting to think about the shift of who we are. Professionally, it changes frequently. Um, people's spirituality shifts and changes. And, um, you know, as, as we think through, even as we move about the world, how we might label or talk about ourselves is different in different places. Yeah, the temporal, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, claim and give you credit, Stephanie, for the temporal nature of the list. That's, that's going to be a, a phrase I use moving forward. Thanks. Um, anything else about the, the shifting sand of this and the complexity of it? I started to think about the things I can't change and the things that I can. So I think of myself being really independent. But then when I see that I wrote down that my parents are divorced and how independent my mom had to be, I don't know, like, I'm probably so independent and think I need to be independent because she's had to be so independent. And I try to separate them in my mind, but whenever I think about it like that, there's a correlation there. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and I think, you know, Amanda, I think that speaks to um, our, you know, you, you use the phrase what we can change and what we can't. Uh, and I think some things feel out of our, out of our control. Um, there are some things that we feel like I can't shift that. And there are some that feel like we do. Um, but, you know, thinking about it in terms of what can you, do you want to claim for yourself and let that be the, the centering part of that. Um, your, your mother's independence doesn't have to look the same as your independence does. And they can both be strong and good. And um, some of the difficulty with these biases that we have is that we've, um, we've often assigned good or bad, win or lose. We've made it um, a, a dichotomy. There's a, there's a good and a bad, a, a winner and a loser. And we have um, gotten into the practice of that in our discussions and our debates. Um, it, it's, it's less about understanding and more about picking apart someone else's argument or experience rather than understanding that there can be multiple rights and multiple wrongs and that most of it is a muddy, slushy, craggy, gray area. Um, there are very few finite, definite absolutes and allowing for, um, allowing for the the gray slushiness I think gives us some freedom um, to know that it, it does change and it does shift and um, that there there is real power in allowing yourself to change your mind change your perception change your thoughts about other people's experiences um, I I spend my career having conversations with college students and with faculty there is never a conversation where I don't learn something, where my perspective is expanded or shifted or causes me to question um, something I have thought, even something I have thought to be hard, fast, fact, or truth. And uh, that, that has been a, a difficult journey for me. I think I was much more certain about what I believed and thought, you know, when I was 18, even then I, you know, m things are muddier now. There, there is less clarity on the edges um, of, of right and wrong um, in a lot of things. And so I think understanding that this is a continual conversation about that is important. Um, so back to the filters and the impact of that and how we begin to address that. Um, three years ago, I did a survey with graduate students at engineering, um, architecture um, kinds of programs. These were either um, graduate students or soon to graduate seniors. And I um, asked them anecdotally, we did a survey, but then we sat and did interviews about, you know, stories, experiences. I spoke with a lot of faculty. I want to share with you um, a handful of comments that students in fields similar to yours talked about their experiences in terms of how some biases impacted them. Because often we say, I can't imagine that happening um, in my department, in my classroom with my students. And um, if we listen to students and to faculty, particularly in uh, marginalized groups, in non-dominant identity groups, um, the stories are the same around the country from school to school and campus to campus. Um, with one group of students, even this week, they were sharing some experiences with me. Uh, and I just said to them, I wish I could tell you um, that your experience is outside the norm. But my knowledge of working with people at colleges around the country is that similar kinds of comments and experiences are happening everywhere. So let me pull up um, this in their own words statement. So these were statements that were made to either grad students in engineering, um, architecture, design, um, um, either student to student or faculty to student or faculty to faculty. Um, this is a tough field if you also want to be a good mother. Um, 
you might struggle with clients in the South. And um, the, I'll tell you what the, the filter of that was. Uh, you're not going to be able to wear your cute shoes on the job site. Um, seems like you're more suited for interior design or something more, you know, creative. And then this last comment um, was made by a faculty member, overheard by another faculty member, made about um, a Sikh student um, who was winning their college's award for best design or whatever the award was that year um, at um, their award ceremony prior to graduation. Um, just at the offhanded comment of, how's he supposed to get a hard hat on over his turban? And these are single lines um, from much deeper, more complex stories. Um, so seeing those, what emotion does that evoke? What do you think about when you see that list of comments? Does it surprise you? Are you not surprised at all? Um, what's your thought on seeing those? I'm not surprised at all. I have a cousin that's a mechanical engineer. She's a female and whenever she went to school, there were very little female engineers at that time. And then she went into the field and she had to get all her equipment to go on site. And she had a really hard time trying to find certain boots or certain things to do that. And it was just, she had to jump through so many hoops to do that. So the one about your shoes on the job site and stuff like that, it made me think of her experiences. Yeah, so, so the, uh, the background to that story, you know, there was just an assumption that, uh, you know, she, she's in class when this comment is made or at a social occasion, and I'm sure she's wearing, you know, she's wearing some kind of high-heeled cute or sandal shoe or something, uh, and the assumption was that, you know, she wouldn't have the wherewithal to wear proper footwear, um, you know, on the job, um, but to your point, um, it's that she had, she even had difficulty finding the proper equipment because it was geared toward male feet. Um, NASA, a year ago, touted for weeks the first all-woman spacewalk at the International Space Center. They talked about it. They talked about it. It was on social media. They posted it. They Twitter and Instagram, and they were so excited. And they talked about how it had never been done before. You know, two women during, you know, a woman only spacewalk and they were doing this repair of something with the whatever. And the day before it was about to happen, they retracted everything and said, Oh, uh, we're, we're going to, we, uh, we need to reschedule this because they had only included and sent up one spacesuit that would fit the women. They were, they knew, I, I, like, I, I don't even know what to do with that. I was like, it's NASA. Like, I expect so much more. Um, but, but even in the attempt to, you know, say, look, look how far we've come. They only sent up one. There weren't two spacesuits. And so, you know, the women astronauts, I, I wish, I wish I knew what their reaction to that was, but that was a, a public incident, a very common experiences that people have. Um, yeah, very common. Any other reaction to the list of comments? So for me, I'm not surprised, but it also makes me sad because that mm -hmm. list could have been the same when I was in school. And it makes me sad that it hasn't changed. Mm. Yeah. When I see that list, it makes me think of um, a, the sense of humor that some like good old boys would have. And sometimes maybe because I am a white man, sometimes that sense of humor that, you know, it's like the golf course sense of humor or something, I get brought into that. and then when people realize I'm not part of that group that is going to participate in that. So, um, you know, it, I think it's different when the jokes are being directed toward you. And if you don't want to receive them, like in some ways, like I, it, it's, it's awkward. And, uh, 
So when I see that list, I think of uh, primarily people who are on their way to retirement and phasing out. Like I almost, I, I'm at least my optimistic part of me sees that that is diminishing and uh, at least in my own personal observations, or maybe it's just because people see that I'm not getting on board. So they don't mm -hmm. talk to me about that, those things anymore, but, uh, but, but it's still present and yeah, it's, it's very um, mm, disappointing. I think would mm. be one word that I would use. Yeah, I, I do think you know, that's, a, that's an interesting perspective that um, whether there's less of it or whether you're hearing less of it because you have not been a receptive ear to it. Um, and, it's, and it's hard to know as we've thought through, you know, shifts and changes that have happened sometimes, racism and sexism and ageism and homophobia, it becomes um, less socially acceptable to say and do out loud. Um, and, but the thoughts or feelings may not have shifted and the impact may not, but it's, it becomes less public. And, um, you know, to Wendy's comment of, um, it happened when she was in school, it, um, it's, it's still happening. And, and I think it often takes different forms. Um, and, you know, there've been lots of questions recently about, um, hate crimes, bias acts, uh, all up into uh, police violence. And people were saying, why so much more? Why is it more? Why are we having more? The Southern Poverty Law Center tracks hate crimes on college campuses. Um, and they have gone up 60, the reported hate crimes have gone up 60% in the last 36 months. And are there that many more happening? Or is it the fact that everyone has a video camera in their pocket and there's a different level of proof? Um, there's a different level of believing people before. Um, people of color, marginalized people would say it's always happened. It's just now harder to dispute my, my version. It's harder to dispute um, a video than it was just not believing the other person. So I think it's some of all of that. Um, and, and it's fluid too. Yeah, Leslie. I, I'm just kind of curious now in no way am I suggesting that there is not systemic <laughs> um, discrimination of non-majority people but when I read that list I was also kind of reminded of um, everybody who has a young child or has had a young child has had the experience of being out in public with them and the child processes their cognitive dissonance of seeing somebody so different from them or whatever with some blah, you know, really loud comment, like, look at that, blah, blah, blah. Yes. And you know, you, you do this and we all did it as children. We probably just don't remember it ourselves. And I'm just kind of struck with how, I'm gonna be really generous and assume that some of these comments were made just of a thoughtless cognitive dissonance of trying to process that something might be different than oneself. Um, and I'm just kind of going, how did, how did, how did so many people get to a certain point in their adulthood and, and not have reconciled that enough, or at least not learn to shut their mouth? <laughs> I don't know. Like, it just seems like, is, is, is this just seriously like a generational thing where hopefully like more and more generations will be exposed to more people or I don't know what. I think, I think yes and no. I think um, for every generation we've said, oh, when this, you know, we're going to grow out, you know, surely it's the, when the older people, when the, and that's not where a lot of the hate is coming from. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think it's, uh, it is woven through every age group. I think it's woven through every part of the country. It is woven through every socioeconomic level. Um, it, it is a piece of our fabric. And um, uh, I, the, the number, I, I can't even begin to recount the number of stories I hear personally on a yearly basis from students and faculty about horrific incidences, incidents that have happened to them. Um, horrific and every time the person who is either telling their story or someone else's starts with I can't believe I'm saying this out loud 
I can't believe I'm telling you what, we can't believe this happened on our campus. Um, we can't believe it went on. Um, uh, the statistic that we used um, Monday night, um, again, from the Southern Poverty Law Center was this. Um, every year, more than a million college students are targets of bias-driven slurs or physical assaults. A million. Reported. Um, that's every year. Um, every day, at least one hate crime occurs on a college campus. 365 days a year, or, you know, 12 months out of the year, every day there's a reported hate crime on a college campus. And every minute, 24 hours a day, a college student somewhere sees or hears racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, or otherwise biased words or images. It, they are coming at us so quickly. And because my work is about tracking these, um, we often live in our sphere of our own one campus or one architecture firm or one design firm. And we, we, we see that as the culture because I get to have kind of a 30,000 foot view um, and see multiple campuses. It is an epidemic. Uh, it's an, it's an epidemic of both violence, physical, mental, emotional, and Everyday encounters, microaggressions, um, it, it's pervasive and it makes me sad, it makes me angry, um, but I, I also deeply believe in the potential of humanity to shift, to change, to overcome. If I, if I did not have that belief, um, I don't know that I could get out of bed every day. If I didn't think our capacity for good outweighed our capacity for evil, I don't know that I could walk this earth. But I do think we have that capacity. I do think people like you taking time to say, I'm gonna have a conversation about this. Even a moment spent thinking about how we view other people, how our words and actions give value to another person that's, that's how we tilt the scales. That's how we shift. Uh, so I think it matters. I think every conversation matters. Um, I don't think there's a simple answer. If there were, someone would have come up with it. Um, I think we are complex, complicated human beings. And there's a lot. We, we all have had multiple experiences. We have individual fears. We have individual anxieties. We have individual gifts. Um, and it, and it takes us, you know, lowering some of our, um, our walls that we have built up in order to say, this is how I'm going to interact with people. So I still have so much hope for how we can honor the dignity and humanity of other people. Um, I, I think you all as a college, the amount of time you've committed to this this week, um, is powerful. And I think, the conversations going forward are going to help create the kinds of spaces um, where those comments happen less and less, where we're aware of them, where we think about, you know, even, even looking around a room and realizing, wow, this is not very representative of our community. Um, who's in power? Who isn't? Who has a chance to speak and who doesn't? Um, you know, e e there are small everyday things that we recognize if we pay attention to them. Um, I travel a lot for work. Well, pre-pandemic, I traveled a lot for work. Now I just travel on the screen lots of places. Um, but, you know, I would, I would be in a hotel 150 nights a year. Um, and I was in, I was five years into this kind of traveling work before I thought, oh, all of the free shampoo and hair products in hotels are only for people who have hair like me. It is not a product that can be used for people with black kinky hair. And I was like, how did I get to be whatever 40 years old and not recognize this and not think, oh, oh, this does damage to the hair of black people. I have been I get shampoo and they don't, and that seems like such a non, but when you add up all, all of the slights and indignities and we're unaware of them and think about how we can shift them, it does make a difference in terms of how we can change and shift. 
Um, I want to put up quickly this great quote by Toni Morrison. So at the end of her, uh, the final uh, stage of her career was as a professor. Um, she was an English professor at Wake Forest. And she said, I tell my students, when you get these jobs that you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. I think we all have power in some way, shape, or form, in some sphere of influence. We all have power. And so making a decision about how you will leverage that or give it away or use it to empower someone else uh, is how we can make shifts and, and widen our circle of inclusion. Um, I still have hope. We are, we are, we are doing good work. Um, does anyone have final comments or thoughts before we close out our, I've so enjoyed this conversation with you all this morning. Um, any final thoughts from anyone? And everybody, you can continue on with uh, her freedom of speech session in about half an hour. Yep. And a couple of ones this afternoon about mental health in the age of COVID and racism. Yeah, we're, we're just, we're going to have some good therapy this afternoon. We're going to, yes. we're going to get in a circle and uh, talk about how we're all doing. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. I Thank you all. appreciate your time this morning and um, hanging out with us and teaching me some new things. Um, Thank you. Thanks Carrie. so much. Great discussion. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Have a good day.